If you're one of those lucky gamers out there that happen to find an NES or an SNES classic, well, you're probably indulging yourself in some of the greatest games Nintendo has ever created. With those two systems combined, you've got yourself an amazing library of games that are worth playing again and again. Personally, what I love about these classic consoles is that they give modern gamers a way to go back and play some notoriously good titles on current televisions and hardware that would probably have trouble playing the older systems properly nowadays. Every time Nintendo releases one of these classic consoles, they're also releasing a snapshot of a bunch of games that were on the catalogs of these systems so that they can be preserved for the future, capturing a little bit of Nintendo's history and demonstrating why they're a force to be reckoned with in the video game industry. While there have been many other plug and play systems released out there, when Nintendo goes to do it, they do it right, utilizing period accurate controllers and giving you very close emulations of how the games would have originally run on the original hardware. There is really no better place to go when seeking out retro Nintendo gameplay. But why stop at the SNES? Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the potential of a Nintendo 64 Classic. Now, I'm pretty sure you're probably wondering what the Nintendo 64 Classic would look like, right? Well, let me introduce you to my friend Adam from It's a Dog and Game, one of my favorite shows on YouTube, and he'll give you the lowdown on what we think the system will feature. Hey there, folks. Shane and I have been excitedly going over our ideas for Nintendo's next classic console hardware. To start off, both Shane and I think that the N64 Classic is going to be roughly the same size as the other classic consoles. Again, like the NES and SNES Classic, we assume that the console will feature a closed faux cartridge slot. As far as any major deviations from the N64's original design are concerned, we did see some minor changes in the NES and SNES Classic consoles, specifically because of the new components in their backsides. So we think it's safe to say that the chunky power brick pushed into the back of the real deal Nintendo 64 will likely be left out of its classic redesign. This keeps things nice and smooth for USB power and HDMI cable slots. Sorry, no big old chunky 64 butt here. Chunky butt. Moving on, we assume that like the other classics, the N64 is going to feature the original console's color scheme, that wonderful sheer black with touches of gray. It'll also don a colorful glossy N64 emblem on the front, just like on the original unit. Oh, and hey, if Nintendo's feeling like delivering a little more fan service, they'll do the right thing and add in a little expansion port area that you can lift. We need to see our tiny fake expanded memory cartridge. Expanded memory. Oh yeah. We uh, won't hold our breath on that one. But that's enough about the aesthetics. Let's talk about what's inside of this sucker. We think internally, just like the NES and SNES Classic, the N64 won't deviate much from the other classic consoles. The Nintendo 64 Classic will likely use the same internal board. However, maybe with some expanded memory to cater to the larger games of the N64 library. Also, a faster processor or graphics chip may be required for a little extra kick to run those titles at the standard 720p Classic Series resolution. Now, we've tackled what's powering our old 64 favorites on modern televisions, but what about how we control these games? Well, one of the things that always made the Nintendo 64 so special was that it had four controller ports. We believe the N64 Classic must have four ports. The system will likely use the same Wii connectors from previous classic systems. There are plenty of N64 games that we're going to talk about that really do make use of those four ports, so we think it's very important to have those at the front hidden underneath another series staple. The console face flap. While we're on the topic of controllers, what are you getting in the box? Well, here's where it gets interesting, maybe a little pricey. We think there's only going to be one controller included with the system. Why? Because the Nintendo 64 controllers are pretty big and far more complex than the original NES and Super NES controllers. We also don't think that Nintendo is likely to copy and paste their old controller guts exactly. This is a chance to improve them. We think that the analog joystick will be a mixture of modern joystick designs to keep costs down and durability high. While the Nintendo 64 controller does have an expansion port on the back of it, we don't think that Nintendo is going to actually have a working expansion port on the back of the classic version of the controller. Much like the back of the classic console, we believe that they're going to minimize the area, making it look like a memory card has been placed in, keeping it nice and flush. But if there's a fake memory card in place, where will the N64's iconic rumble pack go? Well, the rumble pack will be inside the classic's controller. Say goodbye to the clunkiness of the original 
original pack. Keeping it all inside the controller is more durable and likely cheaper to produce. But Adam, with one controller being included in the box and four controller ports, doesn't that mean we have to go out and buy extras? Are they gonna be expensive? Well, Shane, unfortunately, with the design of these controllers and the higher complexity of their build, we believe that they're going to be more expensive than the SNES or NES controllers. The controller that's included with the console is gonna be the same classic gray tri-handle that you remember. But here's where things get interesting. We think that when you do decide to go out and buy extra controllers, you may be met with something pretty cool and collectible. Multiple color options. We could even see those really cool transparent colors that Nintendo used to sell all the way back in the 90s. And I'm drooling. Now with all that taken into consideration of how the hardware is going to look and what the controllers are going to be like, we also want to talk about what the operating system might be like on the Nintendo 64 Classic. The safe state feature from the previous Classic consoles are probably going to party up and join on the Nintendo 64 front. And hopefully the rewind feature that was introduced in the SNES Classic will also come back to play again. Outside of that though, we think that the system is largely going to feel the same as the previous operating systems because we can't really think of any additional features that we would really want to see in the Nintendo 64 Classic. The only thing I can really think of Nintendo doing to make it a little bit more varied and interesting is while the NES and SNES Classic have an operating system that kind of looks like they're from that era, maybe the Nintendo 64 version can have more 3D effects going on all over the place. I mean, the Nintendo 64 was known for 3D games, so maybe they can actually show off the game selection with 3D carts and boxes. That might be kind of cool, actually. Miniaturized looking hardware and pretty looking operating systems are nice and all, but let's discuss the games. The classic systems so far have had pretty decent libraries built into them. The NES had 30 and the SNES had 21 titles, and we think Nintendo will probably go somewhere in the range of 25 or so. The Nintendo 64, after all, hasn't seen many of its games released on other systems outside the virtual console, so it would be very important for them to include a couple of games that we think would be good console sellers. After all, you gotta get people excited about the Nintendo 64 classic if they're gonna buy one. Oh yeah, that's right. So here's our list of 10 games that we pretty much guarantee will be included in this classic system. Number one, Super Mario 64. Let's get this one right out of the way. There is absolutely no possibility that this game is not included on the N64 classic. Super Mario 64 is the definitive entry in 3D platforming games. Not including that in the classic would be heresy. There's simply no way that we won't be collecting stars and spinning Bowser off into oblivion on our own Nintendo 64 classics. Heck, for those unfamiliar with the system, Super Mario 64 is probably the first game you should play when you power on this classic console. Like Super Mario World and Super Mario Brothers before it, it is an essential game to experience. It will absolutely be included. Number two, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Well, where do you go from Mario 64, one of the all-time greatest platformers? Hmm. How about one of the greatest action-adventure titles ever? The Legend of Zelda games have been a Nintendo staple since their inaugural release on the Famicom Disk System way back in 1986. With Nintendo's powerhouse system breaking into the 3D realm, it was inevitable that we'd see an iconically dressed adventurer roaming Hyrule in all his polygonal glory. What didn't we expect from a dimensionally fresh Zelda game? The beautifully delivered beginning of so many classic characters, melodies, and mechanics that would go on to wonder paint the Legend of Zelda series for decades to come. Number three, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. If Ocarina of Time was the solid 3D rebirth of a classic Nintendo franchise, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was surely its first steps into experimentation within its shiny new framework. Here, go on, adventure away, keep the wonderful music, the multi-use items, the tense lock-on combat system, but add in shades of darkness, time management, and a cast that you can't help but become completely absorbed in. What else can I say about Majora's Mask? It's like Groundhog's Day with fairies, swords, monsters, and one heck of a looming MacGuffin. Yikes. Number four, Mario Kart 64. I was a huge fan of Super Mario Kart on the SNES, and when the series leapt to a new console generation, I just had to play it, and it was an unforgettable gaming experience. This game is still just as fun to play as it was way back when I first hopped into that cramped driver's seat. Unlike other Nintendo 64 games that we're going to be talking about on this list, each character in Mario Kart 64 was a pre-rendered sprite asset. And while that might seem like a strange thing to do in a modern game today, back then it was a genius move. See, you're most likely going to be looking at your character more than anything else when you're racing, so that 
that character had to look higher in quality compared to everything else zooming by in the level. And well, the sprites at the time carried more detail than the 3D models that 90s console titles offered. The end result of all of that is a smooth, quick playing experience where the Nintendo 64 hardware is focused more on rendering the levels and not the 3D models of the characters themselves. This is a quintessential Nintendo move, and I honestly believe it's something that a lot of other companies wouldn't have been able to come up with. It's simple, it's elegant, and it's coming at a time when their cartridges really didn't have as much space as many people would have probably liked them to have. Oh, and uh, also, just in case I forgot, it had single-handedly the best battle mode of any Mario Kart game until the latest version of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Number 5, Super Smash Bros. My video game mascot can beat up your video game mascot. Uh huh. No. The Nintendo 64 wasn't necessarily known as the launchpad for droves of new characters. The system did, however, give us an abundance of new ways to control the casts we loved. Super Smash Bros. took the traditional 2D fighting game formula of the early 90s and successfully hurled it off screen. Where other fighting games suffered growing pains, pondering movement in 3D space and maintaining samey life bar depleting goals, Super Smash Bros. was just very different. Players strategically zipped along colorful cavernous screens juggling opponents in a twisted game of King of the Hill. Smash is now a genre in of itself, and while other iterations may shine a little brighter in the Evo spotlight, the series pummeled its way out of the starting gates wonderfully on the Nintendo 64. Number 6, Star Fox 64! Fox McCloud made his fitting follow-up on Nintendo's extremely 3D-capable system. Now, while this wasn't the true sequel that we were promised years ago on the SNES, the one which we finally got on the SNES Classic, Star Fox 64 was one of the very first sequels to a game for a Nintendo system that actually started off as a polygonal 3D experience. While many other franchise games on the Nintendo 64 were turned into 3D games, Star Fox really wasn't like that, and that was kind of awesome. Gamers that loved the original Star Fox got to continue the sci-fi shooter fun with the 64-bit iteration of the series. Unlike the move from Super Mario World to Super Mario 64, which was a very big difference, with Star Fox you kind of knew what you were getting into, and that really did make it a very good great experience. I'd argue that this game still holds up to this day and it's still worth playing. Number 7, F-Zero X. The original F-Zero on the Super Nintendo was a very important launch title due to its speedy gameplay and wonderful use of the system's Mode 7 tech. F-Zero X on the Nintendo 64 pushed beyond the original racer's rocket-paced lineage, while other racing games like Mario Kart 64 utilized a very family-friendly approach to competitive driving. F-Zero X was clearly aimed at a burgeoning teenage market. This game was fast, unapologetically fast, it didn't pull its punches, one wrong move and you could be sailing off a track and blasting debris out onto the land below. They called us retiring. Man, that's metal. With its huge, super stable frame rate, its rockin' soundtrack, and a whopping 30 vehicles racing at the same time. If you missed out on F-Zero X back in the day, you absolutely need to buckle up and feel the crushing G's on the classic. Number 8, Paper Mario. There's always been a lot of love for Super Mario RPG, and a sequel to the popular SNES title seemed like a no-brainer. But the Nintendo 64 fostered a bizarre relationship with some third-party companies. One of these being Super Mario Mario RPG's masters, Squaresoft. Decidingly going solo, folks at Nintendo want to make something that was kind of like an RPG, but kind of something different too. Enter Paper Mario, a game that first looked like Nintendo's return to traditional 2D Mario games, albeit with some 3D elements. But nope, it certainly doesn't play like one. Paper Mario is a sort of 2.5D Nintendo diorama. The classic characters and moves that you expect from a Mario title were there, but with a light layer of RPG elements mixed in. Simplified turn-based combat, great writing, and wonderfully creative visuals make Paper Mario a work of art. A classic must-have. Number 9, Pokemon Snap. Pokemon Snap may not be as fondly remembered as the series' traditional monster-collecting Game Boy iterations, but Pokemon Snap on the N64 was the very first time we got to see the series' lovable cast of characters and polygonal form. Yeah, it was pretty cool. This was a really fun adventure that played a bit like an on-rail shooter mixed with a theme park ride. You could hurl items at Pokemon to get them to react for better pictures and even open up new areas. Best of all, when we finally got our best pictures, we could take the cartridges to our local blockbuster and print them out. Do 
people still print pictures? Uh, hey, Nintendo, I got a horrible idea for an N64 classic peripheral. And never mind, just give a snap. Number 10, Mario Party. While most gamers out there would probably prefer Mario Party 2, Mario Party 1 saw the franchise's core concepts fully realized. This was the introductory game that set the stage for one of the longest lasting numbered franchises in Nintendo's history. Chock full of wonderful mini games and yeah, some pretty shady board game rules, I would argue that Mario Party was the primary candidate for many a destroyed Nintendo 64 controller. And we loved it for exactly what it was, ruined friendships and blistered palms included. We think these 10 games are bound to be included in the Nintendo 64 Classic because they really are the games that define the 64, but let's talk about our next top 10 list. These are games that are likely to be included, but we're a little less certain about. Number 11, Donkey Kong 64. Donkey Kong 64 is a contentious game. We love Donkey Kong 64 for its grand scope, and we also appreciate its soundtrack, sometimes ironically, Donkey Kong rap, but critics may throw steam at the overdone collection mechanics and character backtracking that are essential to 100% completing the game. But still, Donkey Kong 64 is important. It's the first time we played as the Kong family in full 3D. Number 12, Yoshi's Story. Yoshi's Story was considered the sequel to Yoshi's Island on the Super Nintendo. Despite the big push for 3D polygonal games in the latter half of the 90s, Yoshi's Story made use of pre-rendered graphics to build its wonderful storybook characters and worlds. It introduced a new fruit chomping, point collecting mechanic that wasn't used all that much in other Yoshi games. The game tends to get a little flack for its low difficulty, but in all honesty, it seemed to be shooting for a younger audience anyway. We feel that Yoshi's Story should be included on the classic for its awesome presentation, if nothing else, but you know what? Say what you will about its level of challenge, it's still a lot of fun to chew your way through this game. Number 13, Wave Race 64. Wave Race 64 might just seem like a basic jet ski racing game, but there was some really cool ideas in this Game Boy follow-up. For one, Wave Race showcased amazing water simulations. The waves actually played into how you raced each stage. Water ripples altered the course of your vehicle, changing the dynamics of every level you played. Every race felt just a little different from water activity, more so than the actual layout of the course. Combine those hectic waves with decent controls and swaying buoys that boost your speed, and you've got a cool racing experience very worthy of the classic moniker. Number 14, Star Wars Rogue Squadron. There were several very notable Star Wars games released on the Nintendo 64, but we really wanted to grab just one for the classic that stood out beyond all the others. Honestly, you can't get much better than Star Wars Rogue Squadron. Factor 5 did amazing things with this game, especially when paired with the N64's RAM expansion pack. They created gigantic levels with loads of detail and an arcadey space combat experience that you couldn't find in many other Star Wars games before it. You felt like you were actually piloting an iconic Star Wars ship when you played Rogue Squadron. That, along with the iconic soundtrack, made us feel like we were part of the movies. Don't get us wrong, we have a soft spot for Shadows of the Empire. Its Hoth level was actually the seed that grew into Rogue Squadron, believe it or not, but there's no denying that Rogue Squadron has far more lasting appeal, and honestly, it's probably the game that holds up the best today from the N64's Star Wars releases. Podracer fans, please be kind. Number 15, Diddy Kong Racing. Yes, you obviously must have Mario Kart 64 on the classic, but Diddy Kong Racing is kind of important to have too. This wasn't just a rip-off game, it was doing kart racing differently. Not only could you race in go-karts, but you also had hovercrafts and airplanes too, and what was crazy was that they all controlled pretty great. And while a straight-up racing game would have been good enough, there was also a narrative that drove the game in the included adventure mode. Diddy Kong Racing may or may not surpass Mario Mario Kart 64 in some people's minds, but it's still a very worthy entry on this list. Number 16, KB64, The Crystal Shouts. Did you ever wonder what that darn D-pad was on your N64 controller? Well, wonder no more. Kirby 64, The Crystal Shards, was about the only game that made use of it without having any use for the joystick. Yeah, it was kinda odd. The game itself was pretty much a Kirby game. It sounded like Kirby, played like Kirby, it felt like uh, Kirby. It did shine particularly bright in the graphics department though, being a late release in the N64's lifespan. Because there were so few games on the N64 that relied solely on the D-pad, and, well, because we just love Kirby, we thought it'd be cool to include this game on the list. It's Kirby, with a D-pad. Kirby D-pad.
Number 17, Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber. There weren't a whole lot of role-playing games that graced the Nintendo 64 thanks to the absence of Squaresoft on the console, and there's even less titles with a real-time strategy twist. Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber is a brave mashup of both. You control sections of your huge army as they crawl along maps and do battle with adversaries. Formations, equipment, strengths, and weaknesses all have to be considered in order to be successful in war. Ogre Battle 64 is incredibly deep. It has a great storyline and countless hours of gameplay potential. It's a unique title that would be a wonderful inclusion to the Nintendo 64 classic. Number 18, Battle Adventure Racing. This will be a quick one. If you haven't played this, I know what you're thinking. This seems like a straight up simple cash grab or a throwaway title, but listen to me very closely. Beetle Adventure Racing is a solid racing experience. Seriously. Between the very well thought out levels with multiple paths, the fun pickups and power ups, and the spot on frame rate, this is a contender for one of the best racing games on the Nintendo 64. Yes, I'm serious. Number 19, Bomberman 64. I've got many fond memories of renting Bomberman 64 and staying up all night playing multiplayer with my friends. Back then, we were so used to playing Bomberman on the Super Nintendo and on the NES, we never imagined that Bomberman would play so differently in a 3D world. The way Bomberman 64 treated the series staple mechanics was awesome. Using bombs not only to vanquish enemies, but to traverse the areas and solve puzzles was brilliant. Any fear that we had about about Bomberman not being able to make the transition to the 3D were quickly squashed. For the first time, it felt like we weren't playing just a simple Bomberman style game, but having a pretty huge adventure with one of our favorite TNT hurling characters. Number 20, 1080 degree snowboarding. 1080 snowboarding probably doesn't sound like the kind of game that you think would be included on this list, but it's an original Nintendo title, believe it or not. 1080 snowboarding was a pretty well received game that still plays very fluidly today. Whether you're racing racing down the slopes, scraping along asphalt, or cracking some precise moves along the snow-covered halfpipe, it's a whole lot of fun. 1080 Snowboarding arrived in 1998, just before the massive boom of extreme sports titles like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. We can't help but think that 1080 was a bit of an inspiration for the totally extreme early 2000s. So there's 20 games now that we think would be perfectly at home on the N64 Classic. And we've got a couple of other games we want to share with you, but before we finish up this list, we thought of a couple of extra features in Nintendo 64 Classic could utilize to make it a little bit more interesting to buy. With the SNES Classic, everyone was excited to see Star Fox 2 included on the bundle because, well, the game never actually came out. So for us, we were thinking of other additional features that could really get the Nintendo 64 off shelves, simply because if it just features all the games that have already come out, that might be cool and all, but they could do so much more. In Japan, Nintendo released the 64DD, which was a disk drive that gave developers a lot more space to work with when developing games for the Nintendo 64. This is a great thing because the Nintendo 64 cartridges originally didn't have a heck of a lot of space. There were only a handful of games released on the Nintendo 64 DD, and while we don't believe all of them really need to be brought over, we do believe that because the hardware inside the Nintendo 64 Classic is probably capable of running those games, well, why don't we just add a couple of extra features that Nintendo released for older games? For instance, F-Zero X had an expansion kit that gave you access to more levels and a couple of extra racers. I think that would be a great thing to include because we never got that over in North America or even in Europe. But why stop there? The Nintendo 64 Classic is going to have a lot more space than a Nintendo 64 cartridge originally would have, so let's talk about something we've been thinking about that Adam and I call Plus Mode. Because of all that extra space they're going to have with this system, they can add better textures to games, newer models, sound effects, and music files, and heck, they could go back and add Rumble Pack support to a bunch of games that originally didn't have it. And if Nintendo wanted to, they could take additional features from newer releases of the games, like Super Mario 64 DS, for instance, and take those character models and features and put them into the plus mode as well. But why stop there? They could take newer releases of 3DS games like Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time, take those new models and textures and place them into the plus mode. They can take Star Fox 64 3DS and utilize all the really cool new models on there and put it into the plus mode as well. We also wanted to think of something that was really cool and hardcore, something that a lot of fans of Nintendo have desperately wanted to see for years. So we thought of this. What if Nintendo were to show off the demo level for Super Mario 64 2, which is a real thing that Shigeru Miyamoto designed, showcasing a multiplayer mode between Mario and Luigi on a single stage. This level, this entire concept, 
was never shown outside of Nintendo, but we believe it'd be something really cool to include because many of us longtime Nintendo fans have always wondered what it actually looked like. Oh, and Nintendo, if you're listening, there is some demo footage of a game you made once called Earthbound 64. And uh, well, we know that the game isn't completed, but there were some demo features, some models at least that were presented. So if those could be included on the N64 Classic as well, well, we think that'd be pretty cool. We're gonna call these next five games our Dark Horse 5. Dark Horse number one. Doom 64. This game is the perfect way to start our Dark Horse list. Upon release, it seemed like many people wrote off Doom 64, figuring it was yet another console port of the endlessly popular first-person shooter, Doom 2. But that just wasn't the case at all. Believe it or not, Doom 64 was a wholly original and superb entry in the franchise. The game was more or less a sequel to Doom 2, featuring new levels, new original graphics, and yeah, this may sound crazy, a darker look than ever. It felt more akin to a Quake game atmospherically. This game was was, of course, adult-themed and pretty violent, so we're not sure if Nintendo's ever gonna want to include this with the N64 Classic. But we believe that it should be. It's a fantastic game that was completely overlooked upon release and deserves an audience. Dark Horse number two. Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. You might think it's weird that we would be including Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine on this list. I mean, this game was released on PC, so wouldn't that version be better? Well, maybe not. This version of the game on the Nintendo 64 surpasses the PC release in many ways. It features real-time lighting, added musical sequences, additional graphics, better controls of lock-on targeting, and a host of other enhancements that can only be found in this release. Another reason why we believe this game should be included with the Nintendo 64 Classic is that this game was just incredible hard to come by. It only was able to be found in some blockbuster locations and at the official LucasArts company store. Come on, Nintendo, pull some strings and get the rights to put this on the classic. Dark Horse number three. Rakuga Kids. Oh yeah, that's a looker. Not familiar with Rakuga Kids? Are you from North America? That's probably why. This looker was, unfortunately, only released in Japan and Europe. Like some other entries in our 64 classic list, Rakuga Kids is a 2.5D title. But honestly, unlike anything else we've seen on the 64, the animations in this are just jaw-droppingly wonderful. We've heard it called Parappa the Rappa the Fighter, and if you're seeing what we're seeing, well, I think you know why. We don't have any major affection for this game, neither of us has played it all that much, but the idea that a game that looks and moves like this hasn't seen a wider audience seems like such a missed opportunity. Dark Horse number four. Mischief Makers. Oh, the two of us? We like treasure games a lot. Mischief Makers is a game that's very much worthy of its developer's moniker. At first glance, you might assume that Mischief Makers is a simple 2.5D platformer, and while there's plenty of platforming to be had, Mischief Makers quickly shows you that there's a lot more going on under the hood. There's folks to talk to, action sequences to play out, and plenty of puzzles to solve. Mischief Makers was met with a mixed reception on release, but has developed a cult following in the years since. And there's a reason why. The game is weird and wonderful. We and more than a few others would be very happy to see this title land on the 64 Classic. Dark Horse number five. Sin and punishment. Speaking of underexperienced titles developed by Treasure, for a long time, North American audiences were sadly deprived of sin and punishment. The game's late release on the Nintendo 64 saw the game pulled from a release in PAL in North American regions. And boy, was that a shame. Sin and Punishment was one of the best action titles on the console. The game's an on-rails sci-fi shooter with fun, tactical, point-earning mechanics. But you might be thinking, if it was never released outside of Japan, wouldn't there be a lot of work translating this for a classic release in English? Nuh-uh. The game's dialogue is all spoken in English. Also, Sin and Punishment has already seen a release on virtual console in English-speaking territories. Do you know what this means? Even the menus have been officially translated at this point. No excuses, Nintendo. We want Sin and Punishment. That sounds naughty. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our list of games for the Nintendo 64. And well, we do know we missed some. Where's Harvest Moon 64? And yeah, of course, we couldn't get every single game in there. This list is just ones we believe they're actually gonna use. And well, we hope they add more because we think the more games would make the system even better. But at the end of the day, the Nintendo 64 Classic is gonna be a fantastic system that everyone's gonna wanna buy, especially if they utilize that plus mode.